All right. Hello, and welcome to Southern College of Optometry's February webinar on diversity and inclusion here at SCO. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you all are staying safe and healthy. My name is Avery Cunningham. I am a student services and admissions officer here at SCO. I am one of the admissions team members who will be answering your admissions questions and participating in the admissions process. Before we get started, I ask that we all use proper Zoom etiquette by keeping microphones muted and less speaking, limiting background noise, and respecting all of this webinar's attendees and facilitators. We will have time for questions towards the end of the webinar, but in the meantime, if you do have any questions or concerns that need immediate attention, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to communicate with us. Today, we'll be discussing diversity and inclusion at SEO and how Southern College Optometry is making strides to ensure that students of diverse backgrounds feel seen, um, recognized, heard, and included in the experience of being an optometry student and a member of the optometric profession. We will open up with our coordinator for student diversity and inclusion, Dr. Jeanette Pepper, who will be talking about some of the representation on campus and some of the strides that SEO is making to ensure that diversity is a main feature of our experience here on campus. And then we will have a brief student panel with representatives of some of our um, more diverse student organizations, such as NOSA, Spectrum, and Gamma Omicron, which we'll be learning about a little bit later. And then, as I said, we'll have time for questions towards the end. Um, this webinar is being recorded, um, so please feel free to view the webinar on our website um, afterwards. It will be live starting next week. Also, please feel free to share it with friends and family. Alrighty, then in that case, we're going to go ahead and get started and turn it over to Dr. Pepper. Hello, everyone. Thank you for um, being a part of our webinar today. And we are going to, yeah, go ahead and advance. All right, so regarding um, diversity and inclusion here at Southern College of Optometry, we thought it would be advantageous to give you an idea of representation on our campus. When we talk about representation, we're talking about um, minorities or persons of color. There are 4% of um, our students who identify as Black or African American. We have approximately 13% of students who identify as Asian, 1% of students who identify as non-US or re non-US residents. So those are our um, students who are not actually citizens of the US, but they are our international students. We have 34% of students who identify as male. We want to note that because um, optometry, we're noticing across the board that we are um, enrolling more women or students who identify as women versus students who identify as male. So because of that, um, it's a very interesting shift in our profession. Um, we have 0.6, I want to highlight that, only 0.6 of students, students who, percentage of students who identify as Hispanic of, or of any race. 0.5% um, of students who identify as Native American or Alaskan Native. We have 3% of students who identify as two or more races. And again, 66% of our students identify as female. So there you have a breakdown of our student body. We have uh, over 500 students in our total student body. So that gives you an idea of the um, diverse uh, makeup of our students. So regarding diversity initiatives at Southern College of Optometry, so the first question that is asked is what strategies um, are SEO implementing to increase the visibility of represented, underrepresented optometry students? Well, in my role as student coordinator, as coordinator of student diversity and inclusion, we started um, highlighting first generation college students in, uh, in November because that is first generation college students day. So that's one aspect of it. Um, another thing we try to do is highlight um, different heritage months. So again, this is Black, Black History Month. We've highlighted um, Native, American or indigenous um, populations um, day in November. Oh no, that's October, excuse me, in October, um, I apologize. Um, we've highlighted um, 
Latino or Hispanic in their heritage month. So those are just different ways that we try to um, give space or shine the light, if you will, on students that may not um, normally get that particular light. Um, so that's one thing that we're doing. I will tell you that Southern College of Optometry is developing their diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy for our strategic plan. So we anticipate that um, we will be able to implement even more activities and programming to highlight students once that strategy is completed. If you know anything about academia, it takes a while to get those things off the ground, but at least we're getting the ball rolling. What events or student organizations help to support and encourage diversity recruitment and retention? That question actually is probably one that will be better suited for the next section of the panel with um, the student representatives from Gamma Omicron, which is the organization dedicated to women in optometry spectrum. That is an SCO organization dedicated to um, students and our people across either students, diverse or students, um, staff or faculty that are um, allies or identify as LGBT and Q. And then we have our National Optometric Student Association, which highlights or focuses on um, the health of minority populations. And we also have the Public Health Student Association that is also um, a champion for diversity, equity, and inclusion here at the college. Um, and so I'm going to let them talk about the student organizations. Um, the events that we have is for diversity, recruitment, and retention is um, we have a high school program called Success in Sight to um, expose students to the profession of optometry. Um, with COVID, we've been only doing um, virtual series with that each month. However, during the school year, um, but in the past, before COVID, it was an on-campus event where the students would come here for about half a week and immerse themselves in the optometric experience. Our other program that we have or event that we have is Eye on Success, which is a uh, undergraduate or post baccalaureate program for underrepresented minority students where, again, um, before COVID, we would immerse them in the optometric experience by having them to um, shadow in classrooms, talk with um, students, um, faculty members, and also outside optometrists who are practicing primary care or community health service optometry so that they can get exposure to what the minority optometrist um, journey was like. So now that we're in this COVID era, era, excuse me, we are doing a summer program, but it's going to be virtual. Um, but those are just things we are just trying to do to encourage diversity and recruitment. Regarding retention, that would be me. So in my role, I serve to support um, underrepresented minority students in their optometric journey. So that would just consist of me reaching out consistently. I try to do it first semester and second semester. Say, hey, how you doing? Everything going okay? Talk to me, what's going on? That sort of thing to get to know them, to support them in uh, what they're doing um, regarding socially and academically, and then um, any other um, items or concerns that come up, we talk about it and discuss. What is SEO doing to address the lack of representation among faculty and staff? So this is interesting. So we're in Memphis, Tennessee. And um, regarding faculty, we have over uh, 60 faculty um, on 60 faculty on staff, um, but yet and still our diversity numbers are very low. There is only three docs who identify as Black or African American. And we have um, one other doc who identifies as, um, no, two other docs who identify as Asian. Um, and we have a doc who identifies as Middle Eastern North African, okay? So because of that, we recognize that in optometry as a whole, we do have a um, need to feel regarding representation in faculty. So 
what SEO has done, we have teamed up with the um, ASCO, American Schools and Colleges of Optometry. They have a program with um, current residents who are who identify as minorities or um, African or Black, and they um, do a um, series on what it's like to be a faculty member. And so that that's a way we are encouraging um, residents to um, become or become faculty members. To let me step back right there. To become a faculty member, you not only have to get an optometric degree, but you need a residency as well. So what we're doing is we're recruiting at the residency level so that they've already met the requirement for a faculty member, and we're trying to see if they have interest in academia. And so we're pinpointing or shooting our arrow, if you will, at minority, specifically Black residents to see if they are interested, to show them what it's like so that they can become faculty members. So that's what we're doing on the national scale, teaming up with ASCO with that. However, there are other ways um, we can help with that. Um, and again, it's part of, we're developing that in a part of our strategic plan. So even though in, nothing's right now in place, we are trying to set it up so that it's part of our mission and values to make sure that we have proper representation of faculty. Regarding staff, this is a little different. I say that we're located in Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis is 65% um, identifies as Black or African American. Our staff, um, specifically our eye center staff and our tower staff, there are there is an, um, a good percentage of our um, staff members who identify as Black or African American. The problem lies in that we don't have nearly as many who identify as Hispanic or Latinx or Asian. And so those are the two areas we need to shoot to um, do better in. And so um, a part of our DEI strategy is to put um, structures in place to facilitate pipelines for that. Um, and so there are organizations in the Memphis community who um, focus in on those communities regarding Asians or um, Hispanic. And so if we can develop a pipeline in that, we are better able to recruit from there regarding representation. Inclusion efforts at the college. So, Inclusion just means how are we making our constituents feel welcome here at SCO? So what do we do to demonstrate our commitment to enhancing and ensuring diversity and inclusion? Anytime you look at an institution's commitment to anything, any um, task or initiative, you look at how much time they're putting to it and how much money they're allotting for it. And I can say that Southern College of Optometry um, is, is doing a um, good job at making sure I have the time to do the work and I have the resources to make it happen. Um, it's a more so a matter of me learning the position. I came into this role in June, July of 2020 and the extent of my role then at that point has definitely expanded to now in February of 2022. And so we will be, um, putting things in place to enhance the structures that go along with that. So what does that look like? That means that right now I don't have anyone under me, right? I don't have like a secretary or administrator or anything like that. Well, that's going to change um, because SEO is definitely committed to making sure we not only lead the profession in educating the best possible healthcare providers, but while they are here, they know how to interact with any patient and our staff and faculty interact with each other and our students in a manner which is um, reflects inclusive excellence. Um, has SEO publicly committed to the causes of Black Lives Matter and marriage equality? Publicly, no. What SEO has done with Black Lives Matter is that internally we did a, um, I guess, a campaign, if you will. We had a student to develop a um, 
a signage for any persons who wishes to identify with the cause, you know, with the fist pumped up. So we had a student who drew a um, different fists with glasses frames inside of them. And we actually put it on buttons that said, uh, says, I see you. So I see you campaign was for any um, constituent of the college to wear on their lapel or what have you to say, I identify with this particular cause, okay? Regarding marriage equality, we have not, but I will say we haven't done it publicly, but I will say as an institution, any um, employee who identifies as LGBTQ and who has a, a spouse, then we are um, allowed or we definitely uh, make allotment for their spouse by allowing their them to have the same benefits as a heterosexual couple. So in that, when someone comes here, they are um, able to provide for not only their families, but their spouses as well, just as any other person. So I think that's pretty important. A person of color, minority, or LGBTQ plus individual may have some concerns over living in a region of the country, which has been, been traditionally unsupportive of progressive causes. Is Memphis a community that overall is welcoming and supportive? So when you look on a political map and you look at all of the states, um, you'll see that Tennessee is a red state. So that is definitely a valid concern. However, when you break that down into the counties, Memphis is uh, located in Shelby County. Shelby County is the bluest of the blue, full stop, okay? And um, there's a reason why the University of Memphis is blue. That's where their colors are and that the Memphis Grizzlies have blue colors. <laughs> we are definitely a blue state. So Memphis um, is definitely supportive of uh, a person of color minority. Again, Shelby County, the city of Memphis is over 65% African-American or black. So we definitely have um, a high amount of minority populations here. Um, we're about 12% Hispanic and about, I wanna say, I don't remember the exact statistic for Asian, but I think it's 4%. But what I'm saying is that um, SEO is nestled right by Midtown, which is very progressive. You're liable to see any sort of um, expression of, of one's identity or one's creativity or what have you in Midtown. So even though Tennessee as a state is, um, is identified as red, Shelby County is definitely not red. Considering the relatively low persons of color representation on SEO's campus, how do students of color support each other and how they're supported by the school? And then how does SEO cultivate relationships with diverse students and create a safe environment for all? I think those questions kind of go together. So I'm gonna answer them both at the same time. Students of color support each other usually with NOSA, um, which is the National Optometric Student Association. If you remember, I stated that it is dedicated to minority eye health populations. And so um, that's one way officially. Also, um, there are um, other ways by unofficially where they just group together, okay? And they hang out, they may have um, particular um, things that they do together or whatnot, just to make sure that, that each are supported. So that is one facet of it. The other facet of it on as, as far as being supported by the school is through me and my role regarding um, students of color. And that is, I reach out to students of color when they get here after the first midterm. So we have midterm weeks. And after the first set of midterms, I reach out to the students just to check in, see how they're doing, how they're transitioning, that sort of thing during their first year. And then I check in with them again um, their second year, or excuse me, their first year, second, first set of midterms to see how they're doing in that, just so that I can get to know them. Um, is troubling them in their transition from undergrad or moving to a new state or what have you to optometry school and then com 
interweaving the cultural component as well to make sure that they feel that they're, they're supported. So consistently, and usually after the first year, I don't meet with them as much unless it's needed or requested, or I may be abreast of grades. And so I'll reach out to them and say, hey, what's going on? What, what, what you need? That sort of thing. Um, so it's more so, sort of a grassroots effort, to be honest with you. But I do know that with the strategic plan we're developing, I am um, trying to make sure that it's a campus-wide support versus a singular person support, if that makes sense. So that's what we have here thus far at the college. All right, so now we're going to turn over to our SEO student panel. And we have each representatives from um, some of our student organizations here who are going to not only talk about their organizations and what they accomplish, but also answer some questions about their own experiences as whether ethnic or and talk about kind of what they're hoping to see accomplished, not only at SEO, but within the field of optometry in general. Um, so everyone, if you can go ahead and introduce yourselves um, and then we'll get started with the, the panel questions. Okay, I can go first. My name is Lindsay Morgan Tillery, and I'm a third year student at SEO. I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I'm currently serving as the president of the National Optometric Student Association here at SEO. Okay, I guess that means I'm up now. I am Jonathan Wetzel. Uh, just like Lindsay, I'm a member of the class of 2023 here at SEO, and I am the current president of Spectrum. Um, and I also serve on the Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity Committee with Dr. Pepper that um, she spoke of a little while ago. And so I'm happy to be here. And I hope if you do have any questions, you won't hesitate to ask because we're eager to talk about this today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Maddie Schnell. Um, I'm a second year here at SCO. And I am the vice president of Gamma Omicron. Alrighty, thank you. So now would you all take some time to introduce us to your um, respective student organizations, talk a little bit about your mission and um, kind of the, the presence that you have on campus. So the National Optometric Student Association is the student arm of the National Optometric Association. And so just to tell you about NOSA, I just wanna give you a quick peek into the NOA. So the NOA was created during a time where black optometrists were not allowed to be a part of the American Optometric Association. So their missions and goals center around representation for black optometrists, increasing healthcare services to minority populations, as well as increasing minority recruitment in optometry students. And so what NOSA does is we continue that mission as students um, by supporting each other and giving back to the local community and basically creating and cultivating doctors of optometry that want to go and serve underserved minority populations. At SEO, we put on a variety of events, anything from fundraisers such as SEO's Got Talent to a Valentine's Day cookie gram. We do community service. Um, more recently with COVID, we've had to get creative. So we did a blanket drive for a local homeless shelter here in Memphis. And we also did a canned food drive for the food bank. And we have monthly meetings, about two or three a semester. For Hispanic Heritage Month, we did a meeting focused on language barriers. We have a meeting for Black History Month coming up showcasing Black optometrists and their experiences among other things. And we also do things for first years and um, we support each other. As Dr. Pepper mentioned so far as Black students with the numbers being low, we do try to create a sense of community for those who identify as Black um, or minority students, and we do schedule some 
personal social events for people who might find a sense of community in somebody that looks like them or identifies the same as them. It's completely optional. Hey there, I'm up next, I guess. Um, okay, so Spectrum is not a very old organization on campus. In fact, we just sort of came together um, in the spring of 2017. And so this is currently our fifth year as an organization. Um, and it has been, I'll admit, it's been very difficult with uh, the pandemic sort of scheduling events because we are a very much a, what I like to describe as quality over quantity club. Um, when I joined as a first year, I believe the head count at most of our meetings was right around between nine and 12. So it's sort of a more intimate group. Um, and that has its benefits and its disadvantages as well. Um, and I remember we have an organization fair every spring where um, incoming first and even second years are invited to attend and they can sort of just kind of walk through the atrium and you'll encounter a series of different booths, each one directed or reserved for a specific club. And they kind of give you their spiel and try to recruit you. And you can just sort of, it's a place where you can do a lot of touch points with different clubs and decide where you want to end up. And I remember looking at the Spectrum booth and kind of getting the rainbow vibe and the Spectrum. And I was looking through some pictures that they had on display. And I, I remember looking up and talking to one of the third years at the time, who's now one of my friends, Autumn. And I said, okay, I think you guys are my people. And I think I even sort of gave her like a wink and a smile just to sort of gauge her reaction. And she was like, actually, we're everybody's people. And so then she and I started talking about what that meant exactly. And she basically said, we want to be a club for everyone. But certainly we are explicitly the LGBTQIA sort of representation on campus. But uh, we both recognized that there was sort of a need and a lack of a club specifically for minorities across multiple strata um, of life on campus. And so at this point, we certainly want to remain dedicated to LGBT issues and um, whatnot on campus, but we certainly are open to diversifying even more. You know, we want everyone to feel welcome in our meetings. It's sort of an open door policy. Um, in fact, the food for most of our gatherings is stuff that we like to prepare at home and then bring for the purpose of sharing with one another. Um, now, last year, in the height of the pandemic, we did not meet physically even once. And I believe we only met once virtually. And so it sort of dealt us um, a bad blow because um, when you're at SEO, your fourth year, you're on your externship rotations. And so only one of the three semesters of the year are you physically present here. And so it's really kind of like a three-year life cycle to the club. And for whatever reason, I was the only member of my entering class that stayed on as a member of as my second year. And so there really wasn't anyone else to whom we could pass the baton of leadership except me, because everyone else who had previously been an officer was an outgoing fourth year. And so I kind of stepped up and I'll admit it has been a real challenge, but we're actually having a meeting tomorrow and we're going to discuss some different fundraising ideas and public outreach services that we can do. Um, and so, as I said, Spectrum was founded in the spring of 2017, and the founding members were not only members of the uh, student body, but there was a need seen for LGBTQ community among staff members, faculty members, and students alike. And since forming the club, we've had many great speakers, including alumni, staff, and representatives from two organizations based here in Memphis, one of which is Choices, and the other of which is Out Memphis. And so the mission um, here is just kind of create a school community where everyone can feel welcome and supported regardless of their sexual orientation or their gender identity. Um, we also seek to provide a voice for those who seem to have lost theirs and to promote equality and diversity through social gatherings, community outreach programs, and campus-wide activities. And so um, certainly if you should choose SEO as your destination for optometric education, which I hope you will, um, Spectrum is here and would love to, to meet you and have you join us in those missions.
Hi again. Um, so the goal of Gamma Omicron is to support both students and people who have graduated who are already in the profession. Um, well, we support women. We are open to all students, so most of our members um, identify as female. So Gamma Omicron actually started at SCO back in the 1970s when only a small portion of students here identified as female. Um, and as, you know, women grew in the ranks, it kind of fell out as a club, I think in 2014 or 2015. Um, so we're kind of new back on the block. And they brought it back because they realized that a lot of like the speakers clubs were having um, were men and they wanted some more role models who were women to be able to talk to students. Um, so that is our main thing. So we usually have three meetings a semester. Um, our speakers are women who own their own businesses and who are leaders in optometry and pushing the profession forward. Um, one of our biggest draws is what we call um, speed leadership. So during homecoming week, when all of the alumni come back in and we have lots of docs back here in Memphis, um, we host like a dinner and in kind of a speed dating um, setup, we get to talk to women in the profession and get their experiences and network. Um, unfortunately, with the pandemic, I haven't even gotten to experience that yet, um, but we're hoping to bring it back next year and we're very excited for that. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Now we'll start with the questions and these are questions for all of you to answer. Um, so starting with the first one, have you encountered any obstacles in your optometric education because of your culture or identity? And whoever would like to start is free to. Okay, um, I could start with this one. So far as obstacles, I would say um, for me, so I identify as Black. Um, one thing that I have experienced, and like Dr. Purper said, we do, we do have a um, support system, but sometimes you can feel a sense of isolation or being different. And one thing I can say at SEO, having Dr. Pepper, having my classmates, having NOSA, I can find that sense of community that I talked about that we try to cultivate. Um, so that would be the main obstacle, I would say, um, that I experienced, but you know, I am able to find community and kind of push through and just the welcoming environment of SEO also helps with that. All right, I can speak on this. Um, have I encountered any obstacles? Honestly, I will say that I could not be more pleased with my choice in terms of my optometry school. SCO, um, it can seem big at certain um, junctures, but honestly, once you're there for even the first month or two, you quickly realize how closely knit and kind of what a family unit it is, at least in my experience. Um, and I'm just sort of more of a natural extrovert. <laughs> so I think that that's also helpful in terms of how I perceive that, because it, it often is sort of like what you make of it in a lot of different places. But people um, have reached out to me. Um, they've checked up on my mental health and my physical well-being. And um, there's points of contact on campus, um, most notably Dr. Pepper, who is helping moderate today's symposium as well. Um, she's just so great about that. And it really makes all the difference. Um, it's always, it always feels very personal and heartfelt. And I know that it is. Um, so in terms of obstacles, uh, I've never really felt um, openly discriminated against or made to feel different. Um, and I think that is in large part due to spectrums 
presence on campus and feeling like I have um, other allies um, there and present with me. Um, also, speaking about my, you know, just my LGBTQ identification, uh, you know, it's not lost on me that I am a cis white male. And in the larger arena of being LGBTQ, you know, you can be any number of different minority combinations. And so I certainly can't speak for everyone because I know that may be different um, for different people. But I really do feel like it is a campus that is very much woke in terms of uh, recognizing that we still have so much work to do along a lot of different battle lines. And I've always felt invited um, to help that end and also uh, made to feel like I am important and that I am valued and that I do matter. And so um, there is obviously still a lot of work to be done, but speaking from my personal experience, SEO has been amazing and their dedication to that. So I would say, no, I, I don't feel as though I've encountered any huge obstacles. Yeah, personally, I don't feel like I have encountered um, any obstacles either because of my identity. Um, that being said, women in optometry school are very much already the majority. Um, we're not a minority anymore, truly. Um, and we're becoming the majority in the field. Um, I've always felt accepted, uh, especially here at SCO. All right, thank you. Um, next question for, for all of you to answer if, in any way you see fit. How has, been, how has being a historically marginalized student, student impacted you, if at all, during your application process and throughout optometry school? Um, I would say that one thing that I did notice was when it came time for shadowing um, if I wanted to find a black optometrist to shadow, they were few and far between where I was from. And not only where I was from, but kind of looking around and um, upon research, I found out that I think two or three percent of practicing optometrists identify as black. And that was astounding to me. I think that's a common theme among a lot of healthcare professions. And that's why NOSA and the NOA is pushing so hard for diversifying optometry and increasing minority recruitment in students so that as more people come up, new generations come up, they have those doctors of optometry that they can see and they can identify with. Um, so I would say that was the biggest thing for me, just trying to find somebody who I thought would have a similar background or experience or, you know, cultural understanding or cultural sentiments as me, um, somebody that I could talk to and kind of look up to with that. But being a part of NOSA helped because we can get a mentor from the NOA and just a wealth of knowledge um, from people of similar cultural and ethnic backgrounds. Thank you. Um, Jonathan or Maddie, anything to add on this question? Um, I think I'll wait to speak on some of the later questions. So I think Lindsay, she really hit the nail on the head very well with her response. All right, very good. So on to the next question. Um, being a historically marginalized person, what challenges do you feel you may face as a future doctor? I can go ahead and sort of um, speak on this. Um, so I think uh, LGBTQ issues um, in society in general and the way they interface with doctors, this is sort of like a a new landscape that's just sort of a new horizon that's kind of unfurling even as we speak. Um, it, the experience of being LGBTQ or a member of that community is sort of different to when you're like an ethnic or a racial minority. 
you know, ethnic and racial minority members often can't hide their minority status because they literally, they wear it on their sleeves and their skin. I feel like for many members of the LGBTQ community, you can sort of retreat into yourself and even in some instances deny your own identity. And so it's sort of, you know, even though that's not healthy at all and can do significant and extensive damage to your psyche and your, your mental health and well-being, it's sort of an option um, in the interest of self-preservation that I think many people do embrace. And, uh, and many, many years ago, I was a member of that population myself. And so now we're entering this day of age where um, as these issues come to the forefront, um, it's sort of a battleground about, um, you know, our, do we choose our identity? You know, just because we identify a certain way or use certain pronouns, is it fair to expect other people with whom we interface to embrace that and to really give us the representation and the sense of belonging that we know we deserve? Um, and so I think on campus, at least, um, my organization, Spectrum, is talking about launching um, a particular fundraiser where we can sell pronoun identifiers as part of our lapel pins that we wore in our white coats and clinic and elsewhere, um, just so that we don't necessarily need to initiate that conversation, but we can literally wear it um, and let people that are cued into that take notice and thereby know how we identify. Um, and I think it's important now more than ever before, and certainly into the future for doctors, especially optometrists, to be ready to care for patients that um, are trans or misgendered or asexual um, and all the many different unique characteristics and qualities of care that arise because of that status. I know there's sort of a trend now <clears throat> where we're trying to get intake forms, not only in our clinic, but also across doctor's offices to include boxes that aren't strictly binary. Um, do you identify as male or female or, you know, and then I think the trend was for a while there, prefer not to identify. Um, maybe I'm just speaking for me, but I know in my future clinic, we'll have an intake form that has probably nine different options there, <clears throat> just so that everyone feels like they're seen and they're valued. Um, uh, because I, you know, I know now at this point in my optometric education that certain diseases that are, I won't say unique to, certainly not any longer, but um, specifically like AIDS and HIV, I know that that's um, a disease and a disease course that can have definite implications for vision and the health of your eye. Um, and so I think reaching out in that way and having it be not something that needs to be closeted, but be something that can be openly discussed in the interest of health, um, objectively and generally rather than subjectively, I think that will help um, certainly me to be a better clinician, and I hope it becomes the standard and the norm. Thank you. Um, Lindsay or Maddie, anything to add with this question? Um, I can add, I think um, being at SEO sometimes, <laughs> I would say that I get spoiled. I know for a lot of people, the patient demographic um, at Memphis, as Dr. Pepper said, Memphis is 65% Black or African American. And so here I do see a lot of patients that identify the same as I do. But depending on where I go to practice, that could change. And honestly, sentiments around the country, even in 2022, they're not all the same. Everybody is not welcoming. Everybody is not progressive. Everybody's mindset is not on acceptance and inclusion. And so that could be a thing that I face, some bias, some prejudice, um, just because of my racial identity. But to be honest, that's that's life, whether I was an optometrist or not. If I encounter people who think that way, then I would have to interact with them or avoid interaction with them. So that's one thing that I think about, but just having support and community and honestly, all of the other people in the world that are accepting and loving of everyone, 
um, I don't think that that would be a huge deterrent. Alrighty, thank you. Um, Maddie, anything to add on this point? Um, yeah, there's, we are lucky in the sense um, that women are becoming the majority in the profession, um, but that doesn't mean that some of those prejudices um, against gender go away immediately. There is still um, like a pay gap in optometry. Um, I think it's about 16%. Um, so men are paid more than women, um, and whether that boils down to work hours or how women are like negotiating their salaries and contracts from the beginning, um, that's something that obviously we need to address as a profession and also something that Gamma Omicron is trying to teach and support how you can negotiate those kinds of things from the beginning. Great, thank you. Um, so our next question, in what ways do you feel SEO supports ethnic minorities, women, members of the LGBTQ plus community and first generation college students? I know you might have all touched on this previously, but any maybe specific ways or experiences that you may want to cite for our viewers? Um, I know we keep bringing up Dr. Pepper, but honestly, she does such a great job with diversity, equity, and inclusion on the campus. Um, I'm not a first-generation college student, but I know recently in celebration of all of the first-generation college students that were at SEO, um, I think they got cookies or cupcakes just as a congratulations, like we're here for you. And I thought that was very nice. I will say that I think SEO has done an amazing job of forwarding a lot of minority agendas, um, just even in terms of visibility alone. Um, I remember one such instance was last year in the spring when it was really sort of the, the height of the pandemic. Because Spectrum is such a small club, um, we were granted a one-time reprieve to have an in-person meeting provided that it was in an outdoor space like the, um, like the park here in Memphis and that we could maintain a distance of six feet away with our masks on. Um, and so I know that was an administrative call to make um, and it was very well received and it meant a lot. So it, it's sort of like in the small day-to-day -day details, it's not always the what they put on the website or what the what the obvious message is in terms of written communications, but in terms of how business is actually conducted here, I really do feel like there's a commitment um, to making sure that we're represented and represented well. I feel like SCO does a great job of highlighting students from different backgrounds, like Dr. Pepper mentioned earlier. Um, they really kind of help facilitate learning um, about other cultures and backgrounds that you might not have experienced yourself, which I think is a very good thing. And then also, um, as a woman on campus, it's great to have so many faculty members who are women who I feel like I can reach out to and get support from. Wonderful, thank you. And then our last question, um, what is the best advice you feel you can give someone wishing to pursue optometry, specifically historically marginalized students? I would say, don't let what you think could be obstacles stop you from pursuing your dreams. Um, like I mentioned previously, one thing that I felt was an obstacle or it just felt different was not seeing a lot of African-American optometrists to shadow, to, be, to have as a mentor. And then I realized if I turn away just because of this, then somebody who is coming five years from now when I'm an optometrist, when I would have been an optometrist, they wouldn't have me to go to. So 
the one way that we're going to increase minority representation, whether that's racial or gender identity or sexual orientation or whatever the case may be is if you take the first step to add yourself to the number so that yes, you'll probably still be a minority um, for people that come after you. So I would say, if you think you wanna do optometry, look into it and don't let anything stop you. It's a great profession. And I would just add, you know, yesterday I saw a TikTok that was um, posted by a transgender African-American member of the LGBT community. Um, and she had just gained her status as an official um, US resident um, and citizen rather, not resident citizenship. And at the very end of her kind of congratulatory and celebratory message on her TikTok, she said, don't just sit in your struggle, fight your way through it. Um, and that really resonated with me. You know, I think the time um, to be silent has passed. And even if you struggle um, in your attempts to work through some things, you're going to be paving a way for future members of your minority community. Um, and so even if it doesn't affect the immediate change that would you know, benefit you personally, your, your voice will not be unheard and you will be helping to blaze a, a trail and a path for future people uh, from your community to follow more easily than you did. So I really liked that quote. Yeah, I think always um, pushing forward and mentors, even though they can be hard to find, um, depending on where you are, what's available around you. Um, not being afraid to like reach out to those people. In my experience, um, people have always been willing to like talk to me about like their optometry journey. And that has been hugely helpful. And when I myself like get to that point and if someone reaches out to me, like always be willing to help the people who come after you. Wonderful, thank you. Well, now we, of course, want to offer a time for um, our guests to ask any questions of all of our facilitators, not just our students, but also Dr. Pepper as well. Um, so we only have a couple of, of people in live with us on the webinar, but um, we do want to go ahead and, and ask those two individuals if they have any questions. Um, please feel free to use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. There's also a Q&A feature um, that serves similarly to chat, so you can post any questions that you might have for all of our guests. And then while we wait for any questions from our guests to come in, um, Dr. Pepper, might you have any questions for our students that might not have been featured in, in the formal panel? Um, do I have questions for students who are not on the panel? Or excuse me, students, questions that might not have been addressed in the panel. Oh, <laughs> okay. I do wanna say one thing. Um, after the development of my role, what Dr. Reich did is that, who's the president of the college, he did a um, year long um, focus group, um, session with different constituents of the college. So he asked for students, first, second, third years, fourth years, leadership, those that have leadership roles, those that do not, those from marginalized communities, those who are not from marginalized communities and replicated that with the staff. And he was looking to see how inclusive SEO was and what things we can do better. And once we gotten all that information, we compiled it last summer. And so we use that information to begin our strategy. So this giving you, um, I guess, a little bit more context into what we're doing to advance DEI efforts here at the college. Um, it's a slow process and that's what's kind of frustrating. But if you do it right the first time, 
you won't have to keep going back and redoing this and redoing that. So once we figured out or understood the needs of all of our constituents, now we're trying to put um, foundational or scaffolding in place so that we can address the issues in a systematic way. All right, thank you. Well, it doesn't appear that we have any questions from our attendees here currently. And before we close out, however, um, do any of our um, guest facilitators, our panelists, do any of y'all have any final comments or um, insights that you might want to share? Well, I just want to say that. we love you, oh, Dr. Please, Pepper. <laughs> we love what you do, and thank you for making this feel like a home for so many. Thanks, Jonathan. That's sweet. We still have a lot more work to do, but I appreciate you appreciating the little efforts we make here and there. Thank you. All right, then with that, on that note, this brings us to the end of our webinar. Um, we have covered a lot of really great information today, and I hope that this experience has been of assistance to all of our um, attendees. Oh, excuse me. We do have a question that just came through. Um, let's see. From Zachary, not exactly a question, but I am happy and excited to see SEO has this much of a dedication to diversifying optometry. Um, well, thank you so much, Zach, for, for your comment. Um, and that's exactly why we are hosting this webinar, to really show students, potential students, incoming students, all that SEO is striving to do to ensure that the population of students that are coming out of this program are representative of the wider global population. Um, our next webinar will be coming up in March, on March 16th. It will be all about preparing for the OAT, where uh, members of our admissions team will walk you through essentially an overview of what the OAT exam is, um, what is covered on it, recommendations for how to prepare for it. And you'll also hear from a couple of students who will discuss their own experiences with the OAT and their thoughts and recommendations on how um, incoming students can really perform at their best on the exam. If you haven't done so already, I invite you to request more information by signing up for our inquiry form. Um, you'll receive a personal advisor and a personal brochure with information relevant to your goals and experiences. Thank you so much to Dr. Pepper, to Lindsay, Jonathan, and Maddie for joining us and sharing of your time and experiences. And a special thank you for all of our attendees who have joined us live and all of those who will be viewing us um, on your own time. We hope to see you all at the next webinar in August, excuse me, in March. But in the meantime, have a great rest of your week and take care.